So Thomas, my husband, did an amazing job on his proposal to me. When we were in college, he rented a four-passenger plane, and he had a friend who was a pilot. And we flew out of a nearby airport in Kankakee, Illinois, and our college was in Bourbon, Illinois. And um, our friend, who was a pilot, flew us up to the Chicago skyline, and we flew over Lake Michigan and looked at the beautiful sights of the skyline, and then we we're gonna turn right back around and come back and land in Kankakee. Now the best part about this is even though I was anticipating a proposal, he still surprised me. And this is how, even though we went on this extravagant thing, he still surprised me for two reasons. The first is that he disguised it as his birthday flight. And the second is that he was so cunning enough to convince me that I planned the event myself. And so we fly up and he lets us, like he, we look at the beautiful sights of the skyline and as we are turning around over Lake Michigan, he says to me, Liz, we're not actually here for my birthday. Pulls out the ring and says, will you marry me? And I of course say, yes. And that was the start of an amazing life. Like it was, it was great. Now, I'm gonna tell you that I am really motivated by statistics. And let me, let me explain what I mean. Um, I am not scared on commercial flights. And I'm not scared to ride roller coasters. Because statistically, those are two of the safest things you can do. Like, you're, you're more in danger going to Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not going to be scared of a commercial flight. However, the same statistics are not in my favor when you think about going on a private plane flown by a sophomore in college. <laughs> So I had to get on this flight knowing full well that I might die. Now, on the way up, I'm coming to terms with this. Remember, I'm clueless about what's coming. So I'm coming to terms with this. I'm, I'm, I'm flying up, sitting there, and I'm praying, dear God, you know, I don't want to die. I really don't. But I have lived 21 great years. And I'm really grateful for the time you've blessed me with. I mean, I've had a great life. And I'm sitting right next to this wonderful this wonderful man that you've blessed me with. I'm, I'm just content, God. I'm just grateful. So I'm asking that I please don't die, but if I do, I'll get to see you in heaven. You've given me a great life. So I just want to say thank you. Okay. Now on the way back, as I can see the landing strip, I have a slightly different prayer. God, I am engaged now. I better not die. In fact, if I die, I'm going to be so mad. Um, I need to be able to show my friends and my family my ring. And now I'm going to get married. I better not die until at least after I'm married. Please. Thank you. Okay, so now that I have a chance to look back at this, I, I can see that I do believe God was calling me to marriage. And I do believe that God was calling me to marriage with Thomas. However, I can also see from this story that in a matter of minutes, my complete attitude changed. And what had changed? There was now a ring on my finger. And so my engagement changed my prayer from one of contentment and gratitude to one in which I was demanding with God. And I could even go as far to say that before I was engaged, I probably was very willing to lay down my life. After I got engaged, 
I don't know if I can say the same thing. So what I want to share with you is that maybe, just maybe, as wonderful as marriage is and as wonderful of a blessing it is that God gives us, maybe it doesn't always make it easier to follow God. And today, actually, I'm preaching to you about singleness. And I know it's very ironic that I introduced my sermon on singleness with my engagement story. But there is a purpose. And the purpose was that I'm asking all of us today to go on a journey with me to rethink singleness, to change the way we think and see singleness. Our text today comes from 1 Corinthians, and Paul wrote this text. And as I'm reading this text to you, I want you to think in the back of your mind, keep in the back of your mind, that Paul, who wrote this, chose a single life for himself. So would you open up your Bibles with me and turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and I'm going to read verses 25 to 35. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? This is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 25 through 35. Now about virgins, I have no command from the Lord, but I give a judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Because of the present crisis, I think that, is, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you pledged to a woman? Do not seek to be released. Are you free from such a commitment? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of this world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. And his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs, her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit, but a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So I want to tell you that this is actually one of the most um, complex texts of all of Paul's writings. And actually, there's so much scholarly debate on how we're supposed to interpret it, more than any other text of Paul's. And the first thing that, they argue, that scholars argue about is who is Paul writing to right now? Like, we know it's Corinth. We know he's writing to the church of Corinth. But he's actually responding to a letter that Corinth first wrote him. And we don't have that original letter. And it seems like Paul is actually answering a question that the, that the church asked him in this situation. He's answering a, a situation that they're dealing with. And we don't know what that is. But what we do know is that he's telling some unmarried people, he's telling all the people that are reading this letter, to remain where they are. So if you're single, remain single. If you're married, stay married, and if you're engaged, continue on that path to marriage. He's encouraging them to remain where they are. And he says the reason for this is a present crisis. This is another aspect in which scholars debate, what, do they mean, what does he mean by present crisis? There are two main opinions out there. The first is that present crisis refers to something currently happening in Corinth at the time of his writing. Like, for example, a famine. But the other opinion that scholars feel that present crisis might be referring to the fact that all of these Christians are waiting for Christ's return. So, so Jesus has died, has resurrected, has ascended to the clouds, and he said, one day I will return. Be ready. And so it could be that, that Paul is referring to this anticipation. 
this waiting. And I think after doing my research and, and kind of balancing the two opinions, I think this is the stronger of the two. One reason is because there's really not a whole lot of indication that something like a famine was happening at the time of this writing. And the second is that the context of this passage, it really seems like he's talking about this. And so if he's talking about this sense of waiting for Christ's return, he's talking about living with a sense of urgency. That at any moment, Christ could return, and we need to make our lives count for something up into that, to help prepare for that, to, so that our lives help bring in and usher in God's kingdom now. And, and another thing is that a reminder that life is short. Whether or not he returns in our lifetime, what we do matters, and we need to live with this sense of urgency. So when Paul says that you need to be the, do this because of the present crisis, he's referring to living with a sense of urgency for God's kingdom. And right after he says this, he goes into verses 29 through 31. And I'm going to show this verse to you again. This is verse 29, where he says, what I mean, brothers and sisters, is that time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Okay, let me be honest. I do not like this passage. I'm like, Thomas should not ignore me. Like, no. And I should not ignore him. I mean, doesn't God call us to like really love and care for our spouses? And in my pastoral training, one of the things they always say is make sure that your, your spouse and your kids are not getting the back burner. Make sure they should come first before your ministry. Like, so I mean, we're taught, and that's not what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying here, don't, he's not telling you literally ignore your spouse. But what he's telling us is that we cannot let our spouse distract us from what matters most, which is God and his calling on his life, on our lives, and, and the sense of urgency that what we do now should matter for his kingdom. The sense that everything that we should do, that everything that we do in our lives should be ushering in the kingdom of God because we don't know how long our lives are going to be and we don't know when Jesus is going to be going to return. So he goes on. He doesn't just talk about spouses. He also talks, he says, those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Again, he's not saying don't mourn. He's not saying happiness is bad. He's saying even your feelings even your grief, your frustrations, your disappointments, and even your happiness cannot distract us from this sense of urgency that God is putting on our lives. And he goes on, he says one more thing. He says, those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Again, the things that we have, the things that we've been blessed with, they're not bad, but we cannot let them distract us from what God is calling on our lives. So through these verses, Paul is showing us that we all need to live in such a way that there is nothing and no one that distract us from God's call on our lives. We cannot let them distract us. And something else that I wanted to say about the, that list um, is that all of those things, our marriages, our feelings, our grief, our things, all of those things are of this world. And all of those things are not eternal. E Jesus, who also chose a life of singleness, adds in, and when he says in Mark chapter 12, verse 25, he reminds us that even our marriages are not eternal. He tells the Sadducees that there is not marriage in heaven. We're not married in heaven. So even our marriages are not eternal. And I don't like hearing that. I'll be honest. I don't like reading Mark 12, 25, because I don't like the idea of being in heaven and not being married to Thomas. It's kind of sad to me. But I know that God's eternal plan is much bigger than my feelings about that. And so even our marriages are not eternal. And God is telling us that we need our focus to be on God's kingdom, both his present kingdom now and his eternal kingdom. And we cannot let any of those things distract us, even though all those things are good things. They're good. It's good to grief. It's good to have grief. It's good to be happy. It's good to be married. 
But we cannot let that distract us from what God is putting on our lives. And ultimately through this text, God is calling, Paul is calling all of us, regardless of our marital status, God is calling all of us to live in, with an undivided devotion to God. Whether we're married, single, divorced, separated, God is calling all of us to an undivided devotion to God. And Paul said this in verse 35, I'm gonna show it to you. He said, I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Now Jesus, in Luke chapter 14, also gives us a text that kind of talks about this undivided devotion, and this is what he says. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Man, this is another verse. I'll be honest, I don't, I don't like reading. Um, I'm kind of throwing you all the, all the controversial verses this, this, this go around. But I'm going to tell you what he means by hate. Because we know Jesus came here to love and he calls us to love. He is not literally telling us, hate your family. Because he's not talking about hate in the absolute sense. That you need to actually strongly dislike your family in order to love me. No, he's talking about it in the relative sense. So as, as a Christian, I've learned how we're supposed to prioritize our lives. And so this is, this is what I'm always told. God first. God is here. God first. And then we have family, okay? And then under family, everyone else, because we're called to love everyone, okay? And then under that, that's where we have our ministry, jobs, the, the actions, the things we do. That's the priorities that we're supposed to have. But Jesus is saying, actually, guys, no, that's not quite right. Your, Jesus and God is supposed to be way up here. And then family is supposed to be way down here. Now, this is kind of difficult because, as you can tell, I'm very <laughs> pregnant. But family is supposed to be way down here. And then you have your other people and jobs. Do you see drastic difference? So it's not just Jesus family. It's Jesus family. We're supposed to love God so much that in comparison, it's as if we hated everything else. That's how much more we're called to love God. So you can see in this difficult passage that, that Jesus is saying that we are to live with an undivided devotion to God, regardless of our marital status, regardless if we're married, single, divorced, separated, whatever. We are all called to this life of undivided devotion to God. All of us. And that's our main point from this text. That no matter what, we all need to live with an undivided devotion to God. And through this text, Paul takes this a little further. He says in this text in 1 Corinthians that maybe, just maybe, this life of undivided devotion is maybe easier if you're single. Because I'm going to tell you my biggest temptation for idols in my life, things or people that I'm tempted to put before God, is actually my husband and my kids. And so what Paul is saying is, guys, singleness might be a good thing. Singleness might make this life of undivided devotion easier. And so because of that, we can't be viewing Singleness as second best. And when we look at the lives of Jesus and Paul, we see that they chose, each of them chose singleness. And they are the two most influential figures in all of the New Testament that shape our theology more than anyone else. And we see that both of them chose a life of singleness. Could it be that they chose a life of singleness in order to live with undivided devotion? To God. And so we can see through this text that maybe we need to rethink singleness. Not in the fact that we need to um, end our marriages. No, I don't mean it that way. I'm meaning maybe we need to stop viewing singleness as a second best, as an oddity, as a disappointment, as if everyone who's single can't start their lives until they get married. So I'm going to show you verse 35 again. He said, I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, 
but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. And this time when I read it, I bolded not to restrict you because Paul is not saying this here, that marriages are bad. If you've married, you messed up. No, that's not what he's saying here. He's saying we all know marriage is a blessing. We all know that God calls many of us to marriage. And we know throughout other texts, Paul commends marriage in other areas. We know marriage is good. See, in this text, Paul is not condemning marriage. But what he's doing is commending singleness. And so I want to ask all of us today, what, no matter our marital status, are we doing the same thing? I know that we don't condemn marriage. I feel like our churches do a great job and, our, and Christians do a great job of commending marriage. And that's good. Marriage is a good thing. But do we also commend singleness? Do we also commend singleness? So right now I want to address those of you who are married. Because I think that there are many ways in which us married people can accidentally condemn singleness. And the first way is through our language, the things that we say. So one way that we can accidentally condemn singleness is when we talk to singles, always be talking about when they're getting married. Hey, when are you gonna settle down? When are you gonna find someone? Or even uh, playing matchmaker. Oh, I found someone, ha <laughs> I think, ha, I think that you'll get along because your life won't start until you're married. That's basically what it's saying. When, we, when all we talk to singles about is when, when will you get married? When, when, whenever you're married, when you get married, then, then we're, we're making it seem like their lives can't start until they're married. And so our language can accidentally condemn singleness. Another way that our, 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 us married people can accidentally condemn singleness is through our attitudes. How are we viewing singles? Are we seeing their lifestyle as one that is second best? Are we seeing their lifestyle as, as a frustration, a disappointment, a burden, an oddity? Or are we viewing their life of singleness as potentially a calling that God has, has put on their lives? Maybe an opportunity to serve God in a way that us married folks with kids maybe can't. I'm going to go a little further with this because I also want to talk about having kids. Something else that we do as, as married people with kids is, is we talk to those married couples who don't have kids yet and we're like, hey, when are you going to have kids? When are you going to have kids? When are you going to have kids? First of all, it's none of your business. <laughs> Secondly, you don't know how hurtful that could be. There's like, it could be that they're trying and they're just waiting month after month after month with the discouraging news. But the last reason is maybe God is calling them to a life of marriage with no kids. Because I'll tell you, as much as my spouse, I'm tempted to let him distract me from God, even more so my kids. I have the, I have the temptation to let them distract me from my calling. And it, bef, Thomas and I, we were married six years on purpose before we had kids. And those six years, what we were able to say yes to and to do for God, we haven't been able to since we've had kids. And so we can't be pushing people to have kids either because God might be calling them to that life. And the last way in which us married people can accidentally condemn singleness is through our actions. Are we giving love and support to those who are single. Because those of us who are married, we kind of have a built-in community fellowship in our own homes. We come home to people who love us unconditionally. At least that's the way it's set up to be. But people who are single have to find community and fellowship elsewhere. And what I fear is that our churches and us as Christians ignore them. And they don't really have a place in the church. I feel like our churches uh, across the U.S., this is not just us, I feel like our churches are really good at ministering to married couples and people with children. But I fear that those who are single get ignored. And they need community more than anyone else. So a way in which us married people can accidentally condemn singleness instead of commending it is by not giving them the love and support that they so desperately need. Now, I also want to talk to the people in the room who are single. 
For those of you who are single, you can also accidentally condemn your own singleness. And I want to be careful saying this because I know a lot of you who are single, it is, a, it, like I know for a lot of you, it is a disappointment. It is, you're, you're sitting and waiting, wondering. Like it, 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 maybe it's a dead dream. I acknowledge that for some of you. But I encourage you that despite how you feel, I encourage you to see it as a gift, as an opportunity. And I want to use the word season of singleness because I don't know for you. Maybe God is calling you to a lifetime of singleness, but maybe it is just for this time. But regardless if it is for this time or for all time, I encourage you to see it as a gift, as an opportunity that God has blessed you with in that you can serve God with an undivided devotion in a way that maybe a lot of us married folks with kids Maybe a lot of us can't. So let's all continue to commend marriage, but let's all focus on commending singleness as well, because it is not second best. And maybe it makes it actually easier to follow God with an undivided devotion. So as I was looking at this, I, I thought it would be good to give you guys like an example, an inspiration of someone closer to today. The Bible is wonderful, but it's, it's sometimes easy for some people to say, well, that was 2,000 years ago. I do definitely think and it, it does apply still today, but I was looking for an example of someone who lived closer to our time period. And when I did my research, I ran into Corey Ten Boom. And she was born in 1892. So Okay, in the history, but, but much more recent history. And she was born in Holland, the Netherlands, in Europe. And um, I will tell you, when she was in the, the typical courting years, she met a man, and they fell in love. And she was anticipating a proposal at any moment. But at the last hour, he decided he was going to go with a girl that his family approved of more, and instead proposed to her. And for Corey, that was her one shot. She never married, and uh, she was devastated, as you can imagine. But even in this devastation, she, she ended up working in her dad's, her father's watch shop in Harlem, Netherlands, and um, she, she, she lived also with her sister, who was also single. And during these years of prosperity, disappointment, but prosperity, her and her family worked really hard, she and her family worked really hard to serve the Lord with this undivided devotion. She opened up a youth camp for uh, teenage girls and taught them useful skills, as well as taught them about her faith in Jesus. And she also, her and her family, every opportunity they could, uh, were serving their community, um, giving food to the poor, uh, housing people who didn't have a place to be, Whatever they could do, they were doing it. And if we know our world history well, we know what came in May of 1940. Holland was invaded by Germany. And so in the May of 1940, their whole world turned upside down. Now, Corey and her father and her sister were not Jews. They were Christians. They were not in danger of being sent to the concentration camps. But Corey and her father and her sister decided we want to risk our lives to help. And so they became a big, pivotal part of the Dutch underground. They acted, their watch shop, right above it, they had an apartment right above the watch shop, and that acted as a hiding place for refugee Jews as they were being transferred out of the country to safety. And so they would hide, they would have the Jews live with them for a short time as they were being transferred. And then any time a German came, they hid them in this closet. You can see Corey there standing next to the hiding place that, um, that they used. This um, building is still open today as a museum, and it's a free museum. So if you ever find your way to Harlem, um, Holland, I would encourage you to check it out. Um, but... They risked their lives to hide. And in, this, in the midst of this, they are probably, I can imagine, living in fear because they know that if they are caught, they will be sent to the concentration camps. And they know that they are risking their lives. Something else that Corey would do in this time is she stole ration cards because that was the only way anyone ate. And so she stole hundreds and hundreds of ration cards and gave it out to the Jews so that they could, first of all, 
eat. And secondly, if someone's found without a ration card, it probably means they're Jews. So it also saved from them, them from being caught. It's estimated that Corey and her family saved over 800 Jewish lives. And in this whole time, they are wondering, will we be caught? And eventually, the day came. They were caught. And all three, Corey, her father, and her sister Betsy, were caught. And her father died within 10 days of being caught, never made it to a concentration camp. But Betsy and Corey were sent to Ravensbrück, a concentration camp for women. And we cannot even imagine the suffering that took place there. So now Corey and her sister Betsy are living out the worst possible scenario that we can ever imagine. To say it was suffering is a major understatement. But even in the midst of this suffering, even in the midst of this worst case scenario, Corey and Betsy continue to live with an undivided devotion for God. They smuggled Bibles into the concentration camp, and every moment they could, that they were not under Jewish eyes, they were telling all the women there about Jesus Christ and the hope that we have in him. And through Corey and Betsy, many, many lives were converted. Betsy died in that concentration camp. And one week later, on a clerical error, Corey was released. Um, from any human standards, it was not meant to happen. It was, it was a clerical error. And actually, one week after her release, all the women in her age group were killed. Now, if I were Corey, I would be very tempted at this point to say, wow, I'm in my 50s now. Look at all, all I've already done for God. I think I'm going to retire now. I need a break. But that's not what Corey says. Corey says, no, I'm going to continue living with an undivided devotion for God. And even after she was released, she begins to travel across the world telling people her story and teaching about forgiveness. She even met with Germans in person. One in particular was the German who was the most cruel to them in Ravensbrück and asked her for her forgiveness. She forgave him. She wrote many books. If you want to read about her story that I'm telling you now, it comes from the hiding place that she wrote herself. But that's not the only book she wrote. She wrote many books. She traveled all around the world telling her story and telling people about Christ and the hope that we can have in him. She did this all the way up to her death. She never stopped. And so what I want to, when I look at her life, I can't help but wonder, would it have been different had it worked out with that guy, had she been married, would it have looked the same? We have no way of knowing. But what I do know is for me personally, is that Corey laid down her life. She, she, she was willing to sacrifice her life for God and for all those Jews. Would she have done it had she had kids? I don't know. I know for me, I, I, I like to think that I'm willing to lay down my own life, but I do also acknowledge that it would be way harder to lay down the lives of my kids for God. And we are called to put God not just first, but incomparably higher. We all are called to be willing to lay down the lives of our family for God. But I don't know if Corey's life would look different. I don't know what it would look like, but what I do know is that God used her singleness in every stage of her life. Whether she was in prosperity before May 1940, whether she was living in fear of being caught and killed, whether she was living out the worst possible suffering any of us could imagine, or whether she was released and got to find a new life after. No matter what stage she was in, she was living with an undivided devotion for God. And you see, when we look at the lives, not just the lives of Corey, but also the lives and teaching of Paul and Jesus, we see that we have to rethink singleness. It is time for us to rethink singleness right now. We can no longer be seen as second best. 
We can no longer be seen as an oddity, as a disappointment. We have to be seen from potentially a calling from God in which we can love and serve God with an undivided devotion. So, but how do we do this? What does this actually look like to rethink singleness? So I want to address those of you who are single. So if you are single, I encourage you today to thank God for your singleness. Whether it's for now, whether it's, it's, just, whether it's just temporary, or whether it's permanent, whether it's your whole life, thank God for this opportunity and gift of singleness. And then I encourage you to really use this season of singleness to follow God without distractions. And some of those distractions that us married folks are tempted to have. Follow God without distractions. Then for those of you who are married, how do we rethink singleness? Let's encourage those who are single. Let's stop viewing it as second best, as an oddity, as less legitimate. Let's encourage them in their singleness. And then let's bring them in. Let them join in our lives. Give them the community and love and support that maybe they don't have built in inside their homes. And then for those of us who are married, I encourage you to put God first without letting anything or anyone, that one's key, without letting anyone distract us from that calling that God is putting on our lives. So today, I encourage all of you to think about what is it that I am being distracted by. And I encourage you to give those distractions up to God. Because ultimately, God is calling all of us to a life of undivided devotion to God. Whether we are single, married, separated, divorced, God is calling all of us. So no matter what your status is, I encourage you now to give up those distractions to God. And then I encourage you, along with me, let's all live with this undivided devotion to God. Because let me tell you, it's what God wants and it's what God deserves. Will you join me in a life of undivided? divided devotion to God.